Good weekend? Yes. Yes? Enthusiastic, yes. No BB exam? No. We'll change that next weekend. Next Tuesday. A week from tomorrow. You just dying for the second one? No. Dying. Dying? Yes. Okay, so um, today I'm going to uh, finish up talking about DNA replication. I'll talk a little bit about DNA repair. If I get a chance, I'll talk a little bit about DNA recombination. I had a couple questions at the end of the period last time for students who were interested in uh, uh, some particular elements of DNA replication. Shh. Okay. Um, that I will uh, address a little bit today. So um, it's important that we understand some, something about DNA replication. Um, a couple of the reasons that, w that it's important to understand that is if we look at what we see on the screen here. So um, DNA is, of course, um, replication is essential for living cells to live, if cells are going to divide and so forth. And uh, DNA replication and repair are also, uh, I, should, uh, I should say, DNA repair on a regular basis is also important for cells to uh, maintain themselves over time. And so when we think about how we might um, affect cells in some way, we think about can we mess with DNA repair? I'm sorry, with DNA replication. And the reason we think about that is because um, we can control things if we can control replication. So two of the, the um, compounds you see on the screen are what are called nucleotide analogs. That is, they resemble nucleotides. If you recall, nucleotides have a base, they have a sugar, and they have something with a phosphate on there. You notice there's no phosphate on there. But uh, these actually are given uh, to cells because cells won't take up things that have a phosphate on them but they will take up things that have hydroxyl there, and then once they get inside, they'll put a phosphate on them, even if they aren't quite the right thing, which turns out to be useful for making these guys as drugs. So these are analogs, and these analogs are used to treat HIV. So HIV has to convert itself, you may recall, from RNA to DNA, which means it needs to make DNA, and so having an analog that stops DNA replication is really useful. And so what happens with these guys is you'll notice that they're very different down here than, D than, than DNA was. In DNA, we had an OH here, and we had an H over here. We had an OH here, and we had an H over here. Well, these both have H's over here, but they don't have any OH over here. And you may recall that the OH was necessary for making that phosphodiester bond. So what happens is that the top part, this guy up here, will get combined into, it'll, it'll make a phosphodiester bond with the previous nucleotide, but when the DNA polymerase tries to add another one onto here, it gets stuck. And so it physically stops the uh, replication process from happening. These two drugs are given in, as part of a drug, <clears throat> what's called a drug cocktail to HIV patients, and that drug cocktail has been very effective in helping HIV patients to lead relatively normal lives. Uh, it can knock the viral load in the bloodstream way down. It doesn't completely eliminate it for a variety of reasons, but it can knock it way down and, as they say, allow people to live a much more normal life. So um, these are some very good things uh, arising from our knowledge of DNA replication. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the, what's called a replication fork. And a replication fork is important to consider. The replication fork is the place where DNA replication occurs. And we call it a fork because the DNA polymerase that does the replicating is found right there in the middle of where my pointer is. And that middle of where my pointer is, actually, um, the polymerase is pretty busily actually making both strands at the same time. And it has to go through some really unusual processes in order to do that. Now, I'm going to fill, fill you in with some of that in just a second. But suffice it to say that DNA replication only occurs in the five prime to three prime direction. There's very few things in biology that are absolutes. That's one of them. DNA replication only occurs in the five prime to three prime direction. And that's fine and dandy, except for the fact that one polymerase at one place right here, we have a bi bidirectional replication, so we have another one way over here, but this one right here is replicating both of these strands. And if you remember their opposite polarities, it tells you that 
this guy's really got to do some gyrations. It's got to replicate this strand in one way, but then it's got to look back over here and replicate this other one in this other direction. And it logistically is a very, very big problem. And I'm not going to go into it here. If you want to look, there's some links I made to YouTube videos online that I will encourage you to look at. And you can see the logistical things that this polymerase has to do to be able to replicate both of these strands at the same time. Okay? Um, I told you the other day that this polymerase, which is E. coli, can do some remarkable things. And what it does is it's replicating both of these guys at a total rate of 1,000 nucleotides a second. Okay? So even though it's got some enormous logistical hurdles to overcome, it can, in fact, replicate both of those at the same time. And it can do it at 1,000 per second. And it can do it at the rate of one error in about every 10 million in an E. coli cell. Really remarkable thing. In our cells, the replication fidelity, meaning the error rate, is even lower. About one in every 10 billion. Okay, So it really tells us that this polymerase is doing something cool. Because of the gyrations that the polymerase has to go through, these strands are replicated really in different ways. You'll see that the top one, called the leading strand, is replicated in one solid piece. It starts and it goes all the way through as one solid piece. The bottom strand is not replicated in, in one solid piece, but it's replicated in pieces because of the gyrations that the polymerase has to do. Okay? And these smaller fragments actually have a name. They're called Okazaki fragments. And we'll say something about, I'll say something about them as they get going along. Okay? So the, la the lagging strand is made in pieces. The leading strand is made intact. Now, one of the gyrations that the polymerase has to go through, you, you can actually see right here, it involves a looping around of the lagging strand so that it can position things in order for replication to occur properly. I'm not going to go into that, but that's what they're trying to show you with this looping thing that's going on uh, right here. Another very interesting and um, confusing thing about DNA polymerase is that in addition to only working in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, they always have to have something called a primer in order to start the replication process. A primer. Well, if every DNA polymer, what's a primer? Well, a primer is meaning that I've already got a little segment of DNA or a little segment of something from which the polymerase gets started. Well, how does that piece get there if there are no DNA polymerases that will make a primer? Well, it turns out that the primer is not made by any DNA polymerase. It's made by a special RNA polymerase called primase. P-R-I-M-A-S-E. RNA polymerases don't require a primer. They can start replication without it. And so primase comes along, and it makes a little segment of RNA. And then the DNA polymerase will attach itself to the RNA as if it were DNA and go on and replicate its thing. So at the very five prime end of any DNA fragment, you'll always find in the cell a tiny segment of RNA. And that came from the primase. Well, that means that each one of these little segments that you see here also has a little tiny piece of RNA at the front. Now, those RNAs don't end up in the final replicated DNA, so the RNAs have to get removed. Okay? The RNAs have to get removed. And I'll tell you something about that as I tell you about more of the proteins involved in replicating DNA. Are there questions about this? Yeah, back there. So a primer is just a little section of RNA? It's a little section of RNA that the polymerase can start replicating DNA from. So it just attaches itself to that RNA and goes forward. OK? Could you say the name of the RNA polymerase? The name of the RNA polymerase that makes the primer is called primase. P-R-I-M-A-S-E. Yes. OK? Now, DNA replication, is, as you'll see, is, I mean, there's a lot of different things to consider in it because it actually is a relatively complicated process, even though it occurs very, very rapidly. Okay? Well, one of the things I want to tell you about before I uh, tell, go, go more is to tell you more about the polymerases that make DNA. Okay? The polymerases that make DNA. When we look in an E. coli cell, 
E. coli is the organism in which we understand DNA replication the best. All right? When we look in an E. coli cell, there are three main DNA polymerases. Three. Okay? They're called Pol1, Pol2, Pol3. And the two that we'll be concerned with are called Pol1 and Pol3. So these are DNA polymerases. These are the guys that are making sure the right base is going in, making that phosphodiester bond, and then moving further along. Okay? When I look at the replication fork, what do I see? I see DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 3 is always the polymerase at an E. coli replication fork. Always the polymerase at an E. coli replication fork. There are only a handful of polymerase threes that are in an E. coli cell, maybe five or six. There are a few hundred polymerase ones. Well, where does polymerase one come into play if polymerase three is at the replication fork? Well, it turns out polymerase one has a very important function, and it relates to those Okazaki fragments that we saw. So let me show you the Okazaki fragments again. Remember that each one of these guys here, each Okazaki fragment, has a little segment of RNA to start followed by DNA. Okay? DNA polymerase 1 has an enzymatic activity that removes RNA primers. It removes RNA primers. Okay? So let's imagine that I've got an RNA primer right here. DNA polymerase 1 has an activity that has come along, it's removed that primer. What's this right here? This is DNA. This is the end of a DNA fragment that had gotten made by that polymerase. So there's already a DNA primer that's there to fill in the gap. So DNA polymerase 1 takes this DNA, extends it, and basically replaces the RNA with DNA. Okay? That's what DNA polymerase 1 does in E. coli cells. Okay? That's what DNA polymerase 1 does. Yes, ma'am? So it forms the phosphodiester? It forms phosphodiester bonds as well. It's just not doing it at a replication fork. It's doing it at Okazaki fragments. That's why it takes several hundred of them, because there's a lot of Okazaki fragments. OK. Now. I need to de describe to you, there are three things that DNA polymerase 1 does. We call them different enzymatic activities, OK? Different enzymatic activities, all right? Well, here this table <laughs> summarizes it very one. One enzymatic activity is polymerization 5 to 3. That's the thing that's making phosphodiester bonds. It's making DNA. DNA polymerase 1 has that ability. DNA polymerase 2, DNA polymerase 3 all have that ability. DNA polymerase 1 has something called exonuclease 5 to 3, 5 prime to 3 prime. What that's doing is that's removing the RNA primers. Only DNA polymerase 1 has it. The other two do not have it. If an E. coli cell loses its DNA polymerase 1, it will die because it has nothing else that can remove those RNA primers. We have to get rid of that RNA. The cell has to get rid of that RNA because it has to have a DNA DNA duplex when everything's done. If there's little pieces of RNA, the thing will not work. The third activity is called. Oh, that's backwards. It should be say three prime to five prime. Sorry, I had a student make some of these and I haven't proved all of her, all of her work. So this should say three prime to five prime. Okay, that's a three prime. That's a five prime. You see that three prime to five prime is opposite of five prime to three prime. What does a 3 prime to 5 prime do? Okay? Now, this is really cool. You'll notice that all three polymerases have it. Okay? 3 prime to 5 prime is what's called proofreading. Proofreading. Okay? How does it work? Well, let's imagine that I'm a DNA polymerase and I'm moving along making DNA. All right? So I'm starting 5 prime and I'm going in the 3 prime direction that way. All right? So I see a G, I put in a C. I see an A, I put in a T. I see a C, I put in a G. I see another C, I put in another G. I see a T, I put in a G. 
Uh-oh, I just made a mistake. Right? So now I've got a T across from a G. They don't pair right. Instead of being nice and flat, the, T will st the, the G will stick up like this. OK? What happens is that signals to the enzyme that something is wrong, and the enzyme stops. And instead of going forward and putting more DNA down, it starts backing up. And which direction is it going to go? It's going to go 3 prime to 5 prime backwards. And what is it doing? It's chewing up DNA as it's going. It's removing that mistaken base that it just put in. That's why we call it a 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease. Exonuclease meaning it's, it's cutting up DNA. It's chopping away that piece that was there, the mispaired piece. OK? Does that make sense? So as a result of this, once it's chewed back a few bases, then it goes forward again and starts putting more, DN more correct bases in and going along and along and along and doing all that stuff. This proofreading activity is found in most DNA polymerases. Most, not all. Well, you could imagine that you guys have typed things. And what if you typed up a report that you were handing in for your class and you didn't read it over before you went in, or you didn't spell check it, or you didn't do any of those things? You can imagine it would likely have more errors than if you did spell check, right? I'm sure even if you, of course, if you're spell checker, it doesn't always tell you if you use the right word, but at least it'll tell you if there's something in there that's not spelled correctly, right? All right? Well, DNA polymerases that don't have proofreading make many more mistakes than those that do have proofreading. The difference can be a thousand fold higher. So instead of having 10 million, one error in every 10 million, like an E. coli DNA polymerase might have, it might make one error in every 10,000. Still not bad, but that's a thousand times more errors than the good one's going to have. All right? Well, why do I tell you that? Okay? I tell you that because retroviruses like HIV have a DNA polymerase that has no proofreading. One of the reasons that retroviruses are very difficult to try to treat with drugs is that they keep evolving resistance to existing drugs. And how do you evolve something? You mutate. You mutate. You mutate. Mutation actually works to the ad virus's advantage because a drug that stops one protein okay, may not stop a mutated ver version of that protein. So proofreading for a virus, or lack of proofreading for a virus like HIV, actually works to its advantage. It doesn't work to your advantage if you had lack of proofreading, because if you had lack of proofreading in your cells, you would be much more prone to making mutations that favored cancer. So it's a lose proposition for you. It's a winning proposition for evolving a virus. OK. Now I want to say a few words about the different um, proteins besides DNA polymerase and primase that are involved in replicating DNA. Okay? One of them you see on the screen is called the beta clamp. The beta clamp. Okay? Well, the clamp part is shown in this orange and yellow, and the DNA is in blue. Okay? What's the clamp do? Well, the clamp's got a really cool function. The clamp starts out like this, and it closes its jaws around the DNA strand. So my finger's a DNA strand. It just closed its jaws around there. So we can see that that clamp has got a pretty good hold on the DNA, right? The DNA can wiggle. It can go like this, et cetera. But, the but the, once that clamp has closed its jaws, it's going to stay wrapped around the DNA. That turns out to be really useful because the clamp gets attached to DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 3 is held onto the DNA by that clamp. Once it gets on the DNA, it doesn't get off until it finishes its job. That's pretty cool. We have an almost identical protein in our cells called PCNA. It does exactly the same thing as the clamp does in E. coli. 
PC and A. Okay? So again, you guys see another example of where structure and function work together in a really cool fashion. In this case, holding a DNA polymerase onto a DNA as the DNA is being replicated. Okay. What else do we need? Okay. This schematic shows that same replication fork that you saw before, and it shows it in a little bit more detail with some more proteins. So what I'm going to do is use this figure to tell you what all of the different proteins are and what they do. Okay. Well, let's see. First of all, there's our beta clamp. You can see the clamp has already gotten a hold of the DNA. You can see the DNA polymerase 3 is attached to the clamp. And it looks like there's two DNA polymerase 3s. Well, it turns out DNA polymerase 3 is a dimer. And so both units are in the same place. One unit doing the leading strand, one unit doing the lagging strand. Okay? Primase is... Uh, where's primase shown on here? Ba, 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 ba. Primase, right here. Primase is laying down that RNA primer. You see the little arrow there indicating it's going to start an RNA so that the DNA polymerase can come along and extend that RNA primer to make more DNA. Okay? You notice this thing says helicase slash primase. I need to tell you what helicase is. Helicase is a protein that does, I think, almost the impossible. Okay? You'll hear why in a second. Right? Remember I told you that DNA polymerase is moving at the rate of 1,000 nucleotides a second. 1,000 okay? nucleotides a second times 60, minutes, uh, 60 seconds per minute tells me it's doing 60,000 nucleotides per hour. I'm sorry per hour, per minute, right? 60,000 nucleotides per minute, right? And if there are 10 bases per turn of the DNA, that means it's doing 6,000 turns, okay, per minute. 6,000 turns per minute. Well, I don't know about how well you, fast you run your car, but 6,000 RPM is a pretty incredible rate. This helicase has to unwind the DNA ahead of the DNA polymerase at the rate of 6,000 RPM, 60,000 base pairs per minute. I don't know how it does it. Okay, Think about that, 6,000 RPM. That's the rate at which that polymerase is moving along. And does that take ATP? You betcha. Is DNA replication costly from an energy perspective? You betcha. Okay, So helicase peels apart the strands, peels them apart, because it has to clear a path of single strands ahead of the DNA polymerase. Well, let's imagine, let's think about another problem. Here's another problem. Okay, so I can say, okay, wow, this, polymerase, this helicase is really doing its thing. It's pull, peeling apart these strands at an incredible rate. If I go up here a little ways... Don't I imagine that what's going to happen, if I'm peeling them apart here, the strands are going to get more tangled in the front? Yeah. The strands in front, because remember, we're changing the number of turns per base pair. The strands up here are going to get really tangled at the rate of, oh, I don't know, about 60,000 nucleotides a minute. Something has to relieve that stress. Something has to relieve that stress, because if it doesn't, the DNA is going to end up in a knot, and a knot of DNA will not be replicated. Okay? Well, the stress is relieved, and this picture is, is very bad about showing where it's at, by an enzyme called DNA gyrase. It's actually located way up here. It's not as close to the replication fork as you see there. It's located some distance ahead. Right? DNA gyrase has the job of relieving the tension. If it doesn't relieve the tension, if you stop DNA gyrase from working, the E. coli cell will die because this DNA gets tied in a knot and it can't be replicated. Well, how does it do it? Well, basically, it cuts the strands and allows them to go unwind, and then it reconnects them. Okay? It cuts the strands, lets them unwind, and then reconnects them. And it has to do that periodically 
because this thing up here is generating a lot of tension, and that tension has to be relieved down here, otherwise we've got a problem. DNA gyrase is an example of a class of enzymes called topoisomerases, T-O-P-O-I-S-O-M-E-R-A-S-E-S, -E topoisomerases. Okay? That sounds like a hairy name, but it's actually pretty straightforward. Think about isomers, right? The last part of that says isomers, okay? The first part says topo as in topological. So when we think of tying knots, that's topology. That's what, that's what topo isomerases do. Do you have a question? Okay. Okay. Now there's a lot of different topo isomerases that are in cells. This is one, okay? I'll tell you about a cool one. And it's actually a, a strategy for an antibiotic. Okay. When I showed you DNA replication of E. coli the other day, I showed you that bidirectional thing, and I said that when it's done, you had two complete circles. Do you remember that? All right. Well, it turns out that the two complete circles are actually interconnected, just like the beta clamp would be, except for these are now two replicated DNAs, and they're entangled just like this. That's how the, the replication finishes. Well, if cell division comes along, one cell wants this one, and the other cell wants this one, and they fight, nobody's going to get both, right? Well, it turns out that E. coli has a special topoisomerase. You don't need to know this. I'm just telling you for kind, of, kind of a fun fact. called topoisomerase 7. And it has one function. Its one function is it opens DNA and it closes it. OK? I'll do that in slow motion. Okay? It opens DNA, and it closes it allowing the two circles to come apart. If you make a drug that stops this guy from doing this, that is to stop the topoisomerase, you kill E. coli because they can't divide. When we start thinking about antibiotics and we think about how we can kill bacteria and not kill human beings, we think about what's different about bacteria than human beings. Human beings have linear chromosomes. They don't get entangled like that. So if you make an activity, if you make a drug that kills an activity for E. coli, it's probably going to have very little, if any, effect on a human being. And that's a strategy for making an, an antibiotic. That's one type of antibiotic that's actually used. OK. Questions about that? Hearing none? Yeah. No, that's a very specific uh, antibiotic, actually. Um, and it's only, I, I want to give it to you just because it's an example about how we can use knowledge to make an antibiotic. So broader range antibiotics are around, but that is one that will kill that bacterium with, with that ability. Yes? So this picture here, is that just for E. coli or is that? This picture is for E. coli for the naming, OK? Uh, the basics of a, of a replication fork for eukaryotic cells are generally about the same, but you'll see different names for the proteins, OK? So I'm only going to ask you to know the names of these guys. Now, I haven't told you all of them. There's still a couple things on here that I haven't told you. One uh, of which are these um, little um, uh, green things that you see here. Okay? You'll see it's labeled SSB. Okay? SSB stands for single strand binding. Single strand binding protein. These are little proteins. And they do exactly what you see here. They sit on a single strand of DNA. And what they do. There are two things that they do. The most important that they do is they actually protect that single strand. The cell is very vulnerable at this point. Because what if something comes along and damages and breaks that single strand? Well, everything falls apart. The cell's dead. There's no way of getting the things back together. And the cell just stops in its tracks. So protecting those single strands when they're single strands really helps the cell to increase its longevity. The single strand binding protein does that. Okay. There's one other protein on here we need to know about. And it's this guy right here. And you see it's located right next to DNA polymerase 1. And that's because it works in conjunction with it. Let's think about that Okazaki fragment. The DNA polymerase 1 came along, and it chewed up the RNA, and it started replacing behind it with DNA. And here's, it finishes its RNA, and now here's the strand ahead of it. It's DNA, DNA. It turns out that it can't put the two together. DNA polymerase can't link the two. It's got DNA to here, it's got DNA to here, 
but it can't join the gap between them. That's the function of DNA ligase. DNA ligase will physically join two pieces of DNA together. So we're talking about that, that lagging strand, DNA to DNA. When that happens, we've got to ligate, we've got to put those together. That's the, the, the job of DNA ligase. Well, DNA ligase turns out to be a really useful enzyme because I can use it to make recombinant DNAs. You've heard about recombinant DNA. What does that mean? It means in a laboratory, I'm putting together DNAs that didn't start out together. How does that work? Well, I just told you how the DNA ligase can put together a single strand with a single strand, right? On the lagging strand. Well, it turns out DNA ligase can work on double-stranded things, too. I've got enzymes in my laboratory that will cut DNA in pieces. So imagine I take a long chromosome and I cut it into pieces and I get thousands and thousands of pieces. If I start ligating, added some DNA ligase to those, it's going to put the pieces back together, but do you suppose they're going to go back together in the right order? No. Okay. They will not. I'll get kind of a real chaotic mess, right? I don't know what I'm going to get out of that. Well, that's not usually the way I use DNA ligase. Instead, I've got a strategy. So here's my strategy. Let's imagine that I've got a gene that I've isolated from a cell that makes human growth hormone. Okay? I can take that gene and I can isolate that one piece of DNA, not these millions of fragments, but this one piece of DNA that has the gene for human growth hormone on it. And I can take another piece of DNA that will link to that gene that will replicate in E. coli. And I mix my fragment with the gene for human growth hormone with the fragment of DNA that will replicate in E. coli, and I've made a new recombinant DNA. That is, the first one wasn't linked to the second one, but now I've linked them together. Why do I do that? Well, if I put that into E. coli and I treat it properly, the E. coli will use that gene to start making human growth hormone. That is the foundation of the biotechnology industry. That's the foundation of the biotechnology industry. We're using, again, our knowledge about how these enzymes are working, in this case, to actually make something kind of cool. When you hear about genetic engineering, you just saw it in action right there. Making recombinant DNAs is one of the things that's done in genetic engineering. Okay? Well, that turns out to be really cool because it's a heck of a lot cheaper to have bacteria make human growth hormone than it is to, to isolate human growth hormone from thousands and thousands of gallons of blood and getting tiny, tiny quantities. Okay? And that's how people used to get human, <coughs> excuse me, human growth hormone. Okay, so recombinant technology is really uh, useful for making certain products for us. Questions about that? Yeah? Could you? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, it, that, so her question was, can you use uh, technology like that to remove a gene that has some problems? And the answer is, it's much harder to try to pull out one and not damage everything else that you're after. So the answer is no, basically, at this point. There are other strategies people use to treat malfunctioning genes, and we'll talk about them, some of them later this term. But uh, using what I just described to you is not, uh, unfortunately, uh, possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question. Uh huh. Yep. That's correct. Right. So what happens is it extends the previous DNA, <laughs> fills in where the RNA was, but it can't join the gap to where the new DNA is up here. So that's, that's, where, the, that's where the ligase is needed. Okay. So now you know the replication fork of E. coli. There's gyrase. Okay. Gyrase will actually cause supercoiling to happen. Okay. But we'll talk, we, you don't need to worry about that, but it is involved in, in supercoiling. 
There's the um, proofreading, which I described to you, moving along, moving along, replicating, all of a sudden mistake, pops out, pops back, and chews. So when that pops out, what happens is it moves into a segment of the enzyme that it wouldn't move into if it were properly paired. And so this tells it there was a mistake that was made. Okay. Proofreading is not perfect. Even some mistakes make it past the proofreading stage, just like some mistakes make it past your spell checking. Okay. But proofreading is pretty darn good. OK. Um, it'll usually a few bases, 10 or 12 bases, and then it'll move on forwards. Yep. OK. DNA repair. Right. DNA is pretty important material because it's all the information that our cells have. If cells get damaged to their DNA, if cells lose their DNA integrity, they're in deep doo-doo. So cells have evolved strategies for repairing damage to DNA. Okay, I'm going to tell you about a couple um, of examples. Okay, one of the most common types of damage you can do to your DNA is going to a tanning booth. I joke, you're not. Okay, one of the most common types of damage that you can do to your DNA is found in the confines of a tanning booth. Okay, I like to compare going to a tanning booth. Okay to starting smoking, because it's just about as intelligent to do. You don't want to do it, OK? And a lot of young people love to go to tanning booths. Yes, ma'am? So there's a difference between that and tanning suntanning? Well, I think excessive suntanning is also a problem. But what a tanning booth is designed to do is to give you a high dose of radiation, OK, in a short period of time. And if there's one thing I don't want to overwhelm in my body, it's the ability of my body to repair its, its damage to its DNA. I'll tell you what the damage is in a second, OK? But the body has a fixed ability to do that, a real fixed ability to do that. So I go into a tanning booth, and in 20 minutes, I'm walking out with a three or four hour tan or burn or whatever. I'm in trouble. Probably as, almost as much trouble as I'd be in if I stayed out in the sun for too long anyway. But now I've really overwhelmed the ability of the body to handle that, OK? Well, what happens? When I go out in the sun for too long, or I go out in the sun, period, or I go to a tanning booth, short wavelength ultraviolet light is there. And what that short wavelength ultraviolet light does is it will covalently join one thymine to another thymine on the same strand. So I've got a, one strand of DNA. OK, so I've got a TT across from an AA, let's say. OK? What the double-stranded I'm sorry, what the, uh, the uh, ultraviolet light will do is the two thymines will get covalently linked together. That is, they're joined by a chemical bond. Well, if DNA polymerase comes along and it tries to read that, it won't read it properly. It will mutate. Well, I hope I've convinced you that mutation in us is probably not a good idea because the more we mutate, the more likely we are to activate a cancer. We'll hear about that later. Okay. Well, the more of these, they're called thymine dimers, right? Thymine dimers, D-I-M-E-R-S. The more thymine dimers we have, the harder it is for our repair system. And yes, we do have a repair system that will work on those thymine dimers. But the harder the repair system has to work to fix that problem, and well, let's imagine that it doesn't get them fixed before DNA replication has to occur. You start to see the problem? OK? Don't go to tanning booths. OK. Here's your thymine dimers. This is what they look like. OK? There's a thymine thymine. Notice it's on the same strand. It's not across from each other, but it's on the same strand. Here is a covalent bond, actually two covalent bonds, that are created by that ultraviolet light being next to those two guys right there. We say, oh, well, do I have very many thymines next to each other? Only a few hundred million. Okay? Only a few hundred million in each cell. Okay. How does the cell repair that damage? Well, it uses something uh, called nucleotide excision repair. 
What you see right here is the strategy. Here's a thymine dimer. It's bulging because that two, the joining of the two thymines causes a disruption in the base pairing that normally occurs. Thank goodness. Because that tells the cell we've got to excise this piece of DNA. And it does it using something called the ABC exonuclease. What it does is what you see on the screen there. It chops out the affected segment. And DNA polymerase 1 and DNA ligase come in and fill in the gap. If I overload this system, I'm in trouble. Yeah? What do you call that? It's called the ABC exonuclease. Okay? And I call it nucleotide excision repair. Nucleotide excision repair. Okay. And there are other types of repair that our cells do as well. Okay? I'll tell you another one. It's kind of cool. I told you earlier how reactive oxygen species cause problems from a human health perspective. Reactive oxygen species. And I said these were oxygens that had too many electrons and they start reacting with the first thing they run into. They will form a covalent bond with the first thing that they run into. Reactive oxygen species are produced in a variety of ways. One great way to produce reactive oxygen species is to smoke, unfortunately. It causes the concentration of reactive oxygen species in the, in the uh, bloodstream to go up. Well, why is that a problem? Well, here's one example of a problem that, I'm, that I will have with this. Because the reactive oxygen species, when it encounters a DNA molecule, one of the things it will do is it will create a modified form of guanine called 8-oxoguanine. It means it's putting an oxygen onto position 8 of guanine. You don't have to worry about where that is, but that's what it's called, 8-oxoguanine. Okay? Why is that a problem? Well, that's a big problem because 8-oxoguanine will form stable base pairs with adenine. Stable base pairs with adenine. If that doesn't get repaired, what's going to happen on the next round of replication? Well, that 8 oxoguanine is going to have an adenine next to it. And when that adenine gets replicated, it's going to have a T where there was a G previously. So now we've made a real problem in our DNA. We're going to favor mutation the more, <coughs> excuse me, the more reactive oxygen species that we have. There is, again, fortunately, a repair system called base excision repair that will help to remove that. It's removing the, the damaged base. That damaged base can be removed, not the entire fragment of DNA, but the damaged base can be removed and then replaced. I'm not going to go through the details of this here, but suffice it to say that it can get replaced. That's called base excision repair. And the third type of repair that I will mention to you is called mismatch repair. You're getting tired of repair, aren't you? Okay. Mismatch repair occurs when the, polym when the polymerase proofreading doesn't work. Well, that doesn't happen very often, but the, pol the polymerase's proofreading sometimes doesn't catch an error as the polymerase is going along. And so that results in a replication of DNA that has a mismatch within it. Okay? Has a mismatch of DNA in it. Cells have a, uh, E. coli cells, have a system called the mute LH, SLH system, I'm sorry, mute SLH, that recognizes, and mute, by the way, is spelled M-U-T, that's how they pronounce it, M-U-T, S-L-H, all right? It recognizes the mismatch. It's actually able to recognize, and I won't go into it here, but it's actually able to recognize what was the newest replicated strand, and that's the one that it repairs. Okay? If you want to know how it does it, I'll tell you later. I won't tell you here, but it recognizes what the newest replicated strand was, and it repairs that so that what was a mutation is now fixed. Mute S L H. Okay, and we're not going to go through the details about how that works. <coughs> 
OK. Now, I said I was going to talk about recombination. I'm not going to talk about it other than to mention it because it's relevant at this point. And that is that DNA recombination is yet another process involving DNA in our cells that we need to at least, I won't say understand, but we at least need to be aware of what it is. Okay? So recombination occurs when we have replication inside of cells and we have a segment of DNA that's, remember, we've duplicated our chromosomes. We have a segment of one chromosome up here, and we have a copy of the identical chromosome down here. So these two guys are lined up, and the identical sequences, or roughly identical sequences, are across from each other. This might be moms and dads, so they might be similar, but not identical DNAs, but they're very similar. Okay? Recombination is a process where a, the top strand actually crosses over with the bottom strand, and they swap segments. So that when they're done, and they go back out like this, <clears throat> each DNA has been altered. Each DNA has been altered. The top one got some segments, some segments from the bottom. The bottom one got some segments from the top. And because of that, this has happened in every one of your cells as you were a developing embryo, and it's happening today as well. But as you were a developing embryo, what was happening is those swaps occurred, you have DNA that neither of your parents have. Because recombination gave rise to new segments that your parents didn't have. Are there very many? No, not very many. Pretty small in number, pretty few. But it's one of the things that can happen and give rise, for example, to identical twins that aren't quite identical. Okay. There's other things that can make identical twins not quite identical as well. But that recombination process happens, and it happens in virtually every cell on the face of the Earth. Okay. Well, I'm not going to talk about eukaryotes today because that I'm going to save it for next time. But I do have a song, if you'd like to sing a song to finish the day. It reviews all this. <clears throat> it's to a very old tune that goes back to the 1940s. And no, I wasn't alive in the 1940s, but I know the tune. I hope it's an easy tune. I hope you'll join me. It goes, base pairs, they all provide you stair steps to form a helix inside you. A pairs with T and G's goes with C, making DNA for me. Helicases go unwinding, unzippering at rates almost blinding. Polymerases work night and day, replicating DNA. Proofreading the enzymes QC path, choose back from the threes. I can't have a G paired with C, so repair it, please. Chem damage is concerned too, cause it can cause mutations inside you. When dimers stem from sunlight UV, fix the DNA for me. Such pathways of excision cause cells to have to make a decision. Should they go straight ahead with repair or take themselves right out of there? Then lastly, there's recombination. Swap strands readily. Crossover homologous regions. Mix them for me. This story is complete now. The DNA is fit for gametes now. The three R's for the DNA shine. Replicate, repair, recombine. Oh, yeah. Replicate, repair, recombine. Okay, guys, see you tomorrow. I would prefer if you would be so kind as to bring it by my office. If I'm not there, you can leave it with the secretary in the, in the main office and she'll okay. get it to me. I'm just always afraid of losing it. Okay. okay?
Regrades after I get all the exams in my regrade them all at once, and then I leave them back in the BB off. So that'll be later this week. Okay. okay? Uh, do you have the same question? Yeah, just a question. Okay. So you say it's your answer is um, 